So last week we started looking at the folklore of poisonous flowers and we focused on angels, trumpet, foxgloves and deadly nightshade. Now they are by no means the only poisonous flowers in existence. So this week we're going to bring it a little bit closer to home and look at three really common garden flowers, all of which have an element of toxicity to them. So let's find out more about the folklore of daffodils, bluebells and hydrangeas. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Cedric, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. We are continuing with our poisonous plants theme for April. In this particular week, we're looking at plants which are really common and they're not necessarily plants that you would think of as being poisonous. And to be fair, they're generally quite safe to have around as long as you handle them correctly. And obviously, please remember that this episode is for entertainment purposes only, so it's not designed nor intended to replace any medical advice. And I'd basically say, just don't consume any of these flowers and don't use them if you don't know what you're doing, basically. I mean, the don't consume them bit is a fairly straightforward one because you don't really need to. And I think most people wouldn't think to, but I've just got to put that in there as a disclaimer. So this week we are looking at daffodils, bluebells and hydrangea, all of which you can find quite easily and quite readily around the UK in particular. Obviously the daffodils are already out. We had two in our back garden and the wind blew one over and the entire stalk snapped. So thanks for that wind. And the bluebells are starting to come up as well, but we'll get onto that in a minute. So if you're listening to this on YouTube, I have put timestamps for each of the plants in the comments and I have also put the time that each of them starts in the show notes for the podcast episode as well, just in case you want to fast forward to a particular flower. But without any further ado, let's dive into this week's episode. So we are going to start off with daffodils or Narcissus major and these are a really common sight as I say around the UK and they do always look so cheerful hence the Wordsworth poem about them. But according to Margaret Baker daffodils were originally white and they were actually a favoured flower of Persephone. And according to the legend when Hades caught her his touch turned the blooms yellow and since graves fall under his domain that of the underworld daffodils were often planted on graves. And it isn't surprising at all to see that the daffodil is considered the flower of the underworld. Now Pliny and Theosophilus claimed that daffodils grew on the banks of the Asheron, which is one of the rivers in the underworld, and they were there to delight the dead. And elsewhere in mythology, they're more often associated with the myth of Narcissus. Now this does have a couple of variations, but in all of them, there's a, the central fact that Narcissus is this really, really beautiful mortal youth. But the thing is, he's never actually seen what he looks like before because due to a prophecy, his mother's always kept him away from reflective surfaces. And one day when he's out hunting with his friends, he happens to catch sight of his reflection in a pond. And he then falls in love with the reflection of this beautiful youth, which he just sees is another youth. And he doesn't recognise it as himself because he doesn't know what he looks like. And he's then hanging out at the side of this pool, just basically watching himself. And he basically wastes away because of the fact that he's not eating, he's not sleeping, he refuses to leave the bank of the lake. And as a result, he then dies because he's wasted away and the gods turn him into a scented flower, which gives us the daffodil. Now, through this link with Narcissus, the flowers often symbolise unrequited love, too much self-love and vanity. And in typical contradictory language of flowers fashion, it can also send the message, the sun shines when I'm with you. So because they return every year after winter, Samantha Gray also notes that they've come to represent triumph after tribulations, which makes it a good plan to send to someone if you want to ask for forgiveness or to tell someone you appreciate their honesty. That said, they're also linked with bad luck. And if the first daffodils of the year hung towards you, then you were in for a rough time. And it supposedly flowers on 1st of March, which is St David's Day. But in medieval Europe, the flower drooping while being looked at was an omen of death. Now, you do tend to find a lot of daffodils actually hang their heads and it's supposed to be if they're near water that they're kind of facing water as Narcissus did when he was watching his own reflection. So if you do see any daffodils when you're out and about, have a look at what their heads are doing. Now, it's especially unlucky to bring daffodils indoors before any eggs have hatched 
and because their colour matches the down of newborn chicks, you have to leave them outside or the eggs won't hatch. If you do want to bring daffodils indoors, you will need to bring an entire bunch because just one on its own brings bad luck. And a superstition in Maine believes that a daffodil won't bloom if you point at it with an index finger. But if you avoid trampling on them, they will bring you good luck instead. So daffodils are a little bit of a contradictory plant. And apparently you can also wear a daffodil over your heart to bring good luck, which just goes to show how contrary flower folklore can be. Now, some sources say that Roman soldiers actually carry daffodil bulbs across Europe as a healing aid. And some people think that they carried them in case they were mortally wounded in battle, because in this instance, the bulb would speed their exit from this life. And other people think that they were using the sap as some kind of thing for healing. Now, either way, the daffodil does contain harmful toxins, both the bulbs and the sap. So it's not actually going to be particularly useful to you as a healing aid. But that is the humble daffodil. Now, we are going to move on to common bluebells or hyacinthoides non scripta. And bluebells are probably one of my favourite wildflowers and they're also quite common garden flowers as well. And according to wildlife.bcn.org, 25 to 49% of the world's population are actually found in Britain. There are the English bluebells and the Spanish bluebells, but this post does actually refer to the English bluebells. And these are known as fairy flowers because the fairies apparently ring them to summon their kin. Just don't go out trying to hear it because the ringing becomes a death knell if it's heard by humans. And walking through a bluebell wood was considered dangerous because some believed that you'd be spirited away to fairyland. And it was especially dangerous at twilight or the witching hour. And we have had the episode many, many, many months ago on the witching hour. But as a flower beloved by fairies, bluebells are therefore considered unlucky to bring them indoors. So just leave them outside where the fairies can get to them. Now elsewhere in folklore, some believe that wearing a wreath made out of bluebell flowers made you tell the truth. And alternatively, if you could turn the flower inside out without tearing it, you would win the one that you loved. Bluebells do contain glycosides in all parts of the plant, but there are mercifully few reports of poisoning. Now, Samantha Gray notes that the plant's former botanical name was Endymion non scripta, after the lover of the moon goddess Selene. And according to myth, she put him in an eternal sleep so she could enjoy his beauty forever. And then this gives the bluebell its associations with dreamless sleep. But there is another Greek myth which helps to explain its current scientific name, Hyacinthoides non scripta. So in the myth, the god Apollo, who's god of the sun, and the god of the wind, Zephyrus, fought for the attentions of Prince Hyacinthos of Sparta. In one version of the myth, the prince chose Zephyrus, and Apollo killed the prince in a fit of jealousy. Afterwards, he was distraught by what he'd done. When the hyacinth flower bloomed from Hyacinthos' blood, Apollo's tears spelled the word I, Greek for alas, on the petals. The bluebell has no letters, which is why they're referred to as non scripta. In another variation of the myth, Apollo's actually playing kites with Hyacinthos, and it's Zephyros who's the jealous one, so he controls the wind to catch Apollo's kite. It strikes Hyacinthos in the head and kills him. And obviously the same thing then happens with Apollo's tears spelling I on the petals. Now I should point out that the plant that actually grows from the blood isn't the hyacinth as you'd imagine from the name Hyacinthos, it's actually the larkspur, which is what we're going to have a look at next week. But back to the bluebell. For the Romantic poets, the bluebell represented regret and solitude, and in the language of flowers, it could represent everlasting love, constancy, humility, and you have put a spell on me. The English bluebell also represented delicacy, kindness, and sorrowful regret. According to William Turner's 1568 herbal, boys in Northumberland scraped sap off the bluebell bulb to glue feathers onto arrows, and Margaret Baker says that the Victorians believed it bloomed on the 23rd of April, St George's Day. Equally patriotic was its blue colour, linking it to the ocean Britannia ruled at the time. Now we are going to move from the bluebell to the hydrangea, which obviously is more popularly known as a garden shrub, but it does actually contain low levels of cyanide. And I have seen some people saying, oh, you can use the flowers as a cake topper, but they're not edible, so just don't do that. Leave them in the garden, it's safer. Now hydrangeas come in a variety of colours, although blue is said to be the luckiest, which probably explains why they're favoured by the fae. Now the hydrangea is an interesting plant because the colour actually largely depends on the soil. Acidic soil contains more aluminium so the flowers turn blue, but soil that's heavy in lime produces pink flowers, which does rather beg the question how I've seen the hydrangeas in the same flower bed that have been different colours, so I can only assume that they've put different types of fertiliser or whatever on them. But they are very, very, very colourful plants. 
Now, the folklore counsels you not to plant a hydrangea by your door or your daughters won't marry. And the hydrangea can also represent heartlessness, which could explain why having one near your door will doom you to perpetual singledom. Or perhaps it got its associations because of the superstition. The plant can actually represent devotion, gratitude and both thank you for understanding and you are called, which again just goes to show how contradictory the language of flowers could be. And apparently Victorian men actually sent hydrangeas to women who turned them down, accusing them of frigidity. Apparently it just didn't occur to them that a woman might not fancy them. Now, on top of all of this, the hydrangea can also represent gratitude, abundance, heartfelt emotions or a boaster. So you could also then send one to someone and basically say, I think you're a boaster. So it is very much a plant of mixed messages. But it's not all doom and gloom. Because if a witch curses you, hydrangea can be used to break the curse by burning the bark. Now, I can't stress enough how much of a bad idea that is because of the plant's cyanide content, so really don't burn it. However, there's a different version, which is probably a little bit more achievable, that you can scatter hydrangea bark around your house and that would break a hex. So I think actually just simply breaking down the bark and then using that would probably be a much safer way of using the plant. Though again, obviously if you've never used these kind of things before, just just take the folklore from it. Because I don't want anyone to get injured or hurt or anything. Now it is debatable how true any of these stories around these plants actually are. Now embedded in many of them are nuggets of truth about the toxicity of the plants and obviously as I've always said the best way to warn someone away from something dangerous is to tell them some kind of scary story because people do respond to stories and fear more than they do facts. But the other thing that's really interesting I think from these particular plants is how the representations of flowers change. So when you do look at the language of flowers, you can find very different versions of what the flowers mean. And obviously over time, they've then accrued these different meanings. So if you do want to send someone flowers in order to send them a message, please make sure that your recipient has the same dictionary of meanings as you. Otherwise, that could lead to all manner of unfortunate misunderstandings. I do find the ones that I have a look at because you can find them on archive.org. There are some from like 1847 and 1867 and they've got the same meanings in them. But it just seems like once you get past the late Victorian period, they start to pick up new meanings. And sometimes I think these have been added over time. Like we've discussed with the roses post before, yellow roses used to mean like infidelity. And now all of a sudden it's, oh no, they mean friendship. And it's just like, really, where did that come from? So I do think sometimes meanings are added over time and sometimes they pick up meanings based on the myths associated with them which would explain why daffodils are both these wonderful shining lovely things but then also your vein based on the narcissus myth so it is quite interesting to see how these things do feed into the language of flowers overall i do hope that you've enjoyed this week's episode next week we are going to go and further investigate the larkspur which obviously i did mention very briefly in passing in the bluebell segment we're also going to be meeting the periwinkle and wormwood. Wormwood you might better know as the plant that absans comes from. So we're going to be having a look at them because they're like magical plants. But I do obviously still have an episode to come later on in April. So if you do have any requests for poisonous plants, do please let me know. I am considering actually doing poisonous trees for that one. And that would be quite interesting. But again, as I say, please do let me know. And just as a final aside, I did add that extra tier of support into the Patreon. Fabulous Folklore Family system so there is now the option to also support for five pound a month so that you'll get the bonus episode you'll get the pdf of all the articles but then you'll also get every other month an illustrated talk so it's like a zoom based presentation where you'll be able to ask questions there'll be pictures it'll be more of like a hanging out and and chatting about folklore and so on and the first one is going to be later this month and it's going to be on cemetery folklore and sort of legends associated with cemeteries and all that kind of jazz So if you are interested, the link for Patreon is below and you'll be able to get access to that by becoming a member at the £5 a month tier or higher. So without any further ado, I will let you go now and I will see you next week when we have a look at Larkspur, Periwinkle and Wormwood. So have a lovely week ahead and I'll see you soon. Cheerio. Well, thank you for listening and thanks for visiting Fabulous Folklore. I hope you enjoyed your stay. If you did, why not consider subscribing in your podcast app of choice? If you enjoy the show, why not leave me a review and help other listeners to find it as well? 
And if you'd like bonus exclusive episodes of the podcast, then why not support me on Patreon? It does help me to keep the show going and it means that you get a little bit extra every month as well. And you can find all of the necessary links in the show notes below. So without any further ado, I will bid you adieu and I hope that you have a safe travels wherever you're going on to next.